Welcome to Enfield Congregational United Church of Christ this evening. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. My name is the Reverend Dr. Greg Gray. I am the pastor here, and it is my privilege to welcome you to another one of our Faith Exchange series. Friends, if you have not seen one of our Faith Exchanges before, let me give a little word of explanation as to what we're doing here tonight. This church was founded in 1683. We were here before there was a town of Enfield. So congregational churches historically were not called churches that you would go to. They were called meeting houses. Congregational meeting houses were called meeting houses because there was more than just church that happened there. We were the original town hall. The original records of the town were kept in the church. So people came to the church for all kinds of meetings, both religious and civic. It's where you got the local news as well as kind of the local gossip. And so over the course of the past 300 years or so, the church has moved out of that central location in the life of the town. But we are still part of the town because we have members of this church who are part of the town. We are part of the town, and the town is part of us. And so we care about what is going on in our town and in our politics and in our news and in our gossip. So we have these kinds of talks where we get to know each other. It is important for us to get to know who is running, who is community leaders, those kinds of offices, and so we have conversations together like this. It is my privilege now to introduce to you Robert Hodling, who is the Independent Party's candidate for governor. Welcome. It's so nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me, awesome. Reverend Gray. We're glad to have you here. So uh, these conversations are just kind of getting to know you. It's uh, I have told you before we got started that um, these questions really come from your bio, so there's, uh, there's nothing to be nervous about because you're talking about a topic that you know well, yourself. <laughs> you <hope. laughs> if you don't know the answer to those questions, then we have other problems, don't we? <laughs> so uh, let's get started. Uh, so where are you from? I am from, well, originally I was born in West Africa. Okay. Uh, so my father is a Dutch American. My mother is South African, Liberia specifically. Um, we came over uh, due to a military coup in 1980, which brought us here after 146 years of stability of democracy. Military coup broke out. My father had the ability to bring us here to the states, and we're grateful for the decisioning of folks and the uh, the great uh, the Good Samaritans that helped us get here. Uh, but then after I got here, uh, we've lived uh, all over New England. So I've spent some time growing up in Massachusetts, uh, Salem, New Hampshire. Uh, most of my time was uh, growing up in Providence, Rhode Island. I ended up going to University of Connecticut uh, for college. Uh, but right before that, actually, the summer before that, my father got investment during the dot-com era in the, in the mid-'90s. If everyone remembers, when there was a time when Amazon was just a, a, a garage you know, uh, uh, selling books out of the garage. Just Mr. books, Bezos, yeah. Just books. <laughs> uh, and uh, my father called me up and said, hey, come on out and uh, start coding. And I'm like, coding? Okay, sure. And, uh, and I just never left. So uh, I met my wife at UConn and haven't left yet. So 25 years in Connecticut. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my dad is a computer programmer. I, I, I speak nerd fluently. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, UConn, a degree from UConn. What is your degree in? Electrical engineering. Electrical engineering. Yeah, yeah. So actually, quick story about that. I wasn't, and this is something for kids in high school, actually. Uh, I wasn't aware that when you go to university, they have different schools. So I didn't really apply to the School of Engineering. I just was like, oh, I'm going to UConn, right? 
And I show up, and they put me in liberal arts. And I'm like, wait, what? My father was in technology. My uncle was an engineer. And I went the opposite way. Most kids flunk out of engineering into liberal arts. I was going from liberal arts into engineering. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, the dean actually gave me a, 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 a sort of a, 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 a threshold to pass. He says, you have to get two, dean's list two years in a row in engineering at UConn in order to be let into the school. So thankfully, I met my wife. She focused me. I didn't get to party. <laughs> I'm looking at all the other kids like, man, they're going out to party. I'm studying. But it was the best thing I ever did because I got the degree and sort of put my life in a certain trajectory. So it was good times. Awesome. Awesome. So then from there on to um, Stanford. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, we're sort of jumping ahead. But, uh, but yeah, so throughout my career, I've, I've spent a lot of... Um, at a lot of different industries. I've worked in um, you, you know, casino gaming, finance, hedge fund, uh, you know, uh, food automation, uh, patent, trademark and searching. So I've done a lot of different things in my career. So where I am now is I work out of Stanford. I'm a senior vice president of a large regional bank. And, um, and uh, I'm essentially responsible for uh, digital and retail online banking. So I, I say one of the reasons I'm qualified to run for governor is I'm actually responsible for billions of dollars of other people's money, not my own. <laughs> so if someone loses a single dollar on their account, I need to make sure they get that dollar back. I hear you. Yeah, I hear. So. so you founded Verbi. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about Verbi. So um, I actually had a friend who, at the time, if we recall, uh, December uh, 2012, uh, the Sandy Hook uh, event occurred uh, in Newtown. Uh, I won't go into too much detail, but for the folks out there, everyone knows I'm referring to. Um, but um, I knew some people who lost little ones. And uh, I was a senior engineer. I had uh, a network. I had money at my disposal. And I thought to myself, what can I do? How can I start with myself to make a difference? And it wasn't really about money. I just wanted to help make schools safer. Mm -hmm. So I ended up um, using my contacts to get uh, with a acoustics expert who actually made uh, sensors for our special forces serving Iraq and Afghanistan. So they would, you know, they would test it and it would tell them range and bearing so they could return enemy fire. And I looked at that as an innovator. I said, can I take that same technology working with this individual and his organization and commercialize it, shrink it, make it look like a smoke detector, embed it in a school, connect it to some phones, and within two seconds I can detect gunfire. So it was uh, one of the most challenging but one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. I met a lot of people, I got investment. That's when, and some people tell me, I got kineticized. There's this word where you get kineticized. And what that means is the bureaucracy <laughs> okay. wears you down. So I remember going to, um, Kinetic Innovations, I remember going to school uh, boards, I remember going to police departments, I worked with the New Haven PD, um, but just over time, so much bureaucracy, so much red tape, it just wound, grinded it down to nothing. And unfortunately, to this day, we see things like Uvalde. Our system, um, and I'll wrap up on this one, our system satisfied 32 of the expectations of a, of a dream system that would help kids be safe, where we could tell teachers and students within two seconds Here's where the threat is, and at the same time, inform um, uh, first responders, the police, uh, where the threat is. Give them eyes and ears, uh, so they can move towards the threat as people move away. But unfortunately, um, just you know, and Lamont says about his own wife, it's really complex to to start a business in Connecticut, and I know what she's talking about. And Lamont, you know, hallelujah, she's right. <laughs> you know, if you eat too much nutmeg, it's toxic. So instead of saying <laughs> um, kineticized, maybe you should say nutmeg. Nutmeg. <laughs> just just a, a, a thought there for you. <laughs> so uh, tell me about these uh, these other things. We're I'm sure people are interested in how your your background is going to help you for your job, right? So right. Um, you've also worked in food automation. Yes. So I worked at a company uh, called Kitchen Brains, and it's actually a world leader in automating food for the biggest burger, chicken, and taco people you can think of. Now, I won't say it because I'm under NDA, but I'm sure everyone listening has probably eaten some of their products uh, mm -hmm. at a fast food restaurant. 
we are the ones who, who when you press the button, a 16-year-old doesn't need to think. They, they sort of load it, they press the button, it cooks it, they put it together in some wrappers, and then it tells them how many. So when you go to the drive-through, you're looking at the drive-through, it tells you what you need to be doing to serve the order. So those are, so I led a good, a, a, a good size of a group, and it gave me great experience. I flew all over the world. Uh, because people need chicken, tacos, and burgers everywhere, I learned. And they love it uh, in Europe as much as they love in America. But, uh, but those experiences taught me often you have to know j as much about the business and the industry as the business leaders in order to make an effective solution. So one of the things I pride myself on is being uh, an expert in breaking down big, complex problems and being a proven, a proven problem solver. I think that background across multiple industries really makes me highly qualified to run for governor. Awesome. So since you won't tell us uh, which organization that was, could you possibly like sing their theme song? <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. No, you well, don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where's the beef? Or, uh, uh, well, I think I some... need a bigger box. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any, 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 some of those? <laughs> Um, patents and trademarks. Yes. Tell me about patents and trademarks. So out of UConn, I met, um, it's, it's kind of funny. I was a, I, my father, going back to my own how it's related to this one, it was a company called Neurath, but I almost didn't get there. So this is an offshoot of UConn. And it's, it was started by a gentleman, uh, Wilder, Dr. Wilder, who then sold it to another gentleman, Kevin Bully. But it's, it's a really important organization at the time. Search was not easily, Google was just coming up, uh, and folks were looking for patents and trademarks. So I took a back seat from writing software in order to become a researcher for a couple of years. Folks thought I was crazy. I'm like, no, 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 I just take a break. I want to learn about intellectual property and trademarks. And it taught me a lot, actually about businesses and what intellectual capital really has value to an organization. And it actually applied to my career later, but the, the, the point I'm making is I almost didn't get that job, it was actually my wife. So I have to rewind for a moment. When I was working at my father's company, um, he lost, uh, it was a great company, we competed with uh, IBM and Oracle out of Westport, so you know that was over, right? At, at the time, I didn't know what that meant. I'm like, IBM and Oracle, I, that meant we were gonna lose, right? But, but, but my father brings me in one day, and he goes, son, um, I gotta lay you off. I'm like, dad, what are you talking about? <laughs> he goes, we, we, you know, you lost our investor, um, we did what we can, but you know, but you got great severance. And I'm like, it, to, to have my first experience from my father to lay me off, it's the only time I've ever been laid off in my life, but I realized I don't like this feeling and, and I'm gonna do what I need to do to make sure it doesn't happen to me again. But it also taught me the value of a livelihood and what it means to be a working person where you may not know where your next check is coming from, right? Uh, as a recent graduate, so I was unemployed and unemployable after the dot-com bust. Mm. And uh, my wife actually got invited and she didn't like the job. She said, hey, did you ever call this guy? Uh, Rob, we were just dating at the time. And if she didn't say that to the hiring manager, I never would have gotten that job. I probably would still be at home playing video games or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So tell me about gaming systems. Ah, so uh, another one of these experiences. So I, um, I uh, had gotten tired. I was uh, a, a consultant at IBM for a time, and they're flying me here, there, and everywhere across the country. I'd be in California at one major uh, company, then I'd fly back to Virginia, and then I'd come back home every weekend. Uh, I would go, and so um, on, on a Thursday night, I would uh, head home, and on Sunday, I had my bag already packed, I'd head out. And I just had three young kids. And I remember my wife um, calling me up, and it leads to this story, which is she was sick and she had to go to the ER, and I was in Virginia. I couldn't get on a train, I couldn't go home, my wife's there, and I'm like, and I realized, Work or family, career or family, what's really important, right? And I remember going to my boss, and he was like, no, you can't go home. You got to go to this meeting. I was shocked, right, the next morning because I couldn't get a train that night. Thankfully, my wife's, um, her, uh, her, her relatives watched the kids, and she went to the ER. But she's fine. She was fine. She had blood pressure at the time. But I said, you know what? I got to do something that's more relaxing. So someone comes to me, and they go, hey, Rob, there's this great job at a casino gaming company. I'm thinking, oh, 
this got to be easier than finance at IBM, right? So I, uh, I, I get this job, and they go, we're going to make a casino gaming system like, um, I don't know if everyone ever seen this movie um, with uh, Quantum Solace with James Bond, where they're playing something called Baccarat. Yeah. And there's Banker's Player, and there's a lot of big money on the table. In that movie, they even try to kill him, right? But in the real world, <laughs> <laughs> in the real world, there's a lot of angry people losing a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but essentially, we made a system that would scan your chips, so you, you couldn't cheat. When you put the chips down, we knew exactly how much you're betting. We'd calculate bankers' house advantage. We'd calculate down to the percentage how much you're going to win, how much you're going to lose. We already knew before you even put it down. And then we also had ultraviolet light where we would, I'm probably, I'm, I'm way past NDA, but anyway, but we had that ultraviolet light and we would scan your cards. We even knew what cards you drew, what chips you did. And we, it was still fair. It was just to prevent cheating. Yeah. Uh, and, and for the great pleasure of putting this together, they sent me to Macau which is bigger than Vegas, being out there and, and going into a room full of people, playing on your table. My table's where the whales went. So guys and, and gals who had a lot of money, I think it was like a 50,000 bet minimum to even get to the table. Mm -hmm. And I got to sit there and watch, and I'm like, wow. And then, of course, the arguments occur when they lost their, uh, some of their winnings. Right. But, uh, but it was definitely a big experience. But again, it taught me something. It taught me like, wow, you know? calculated complex problems and how do you make a good user experience and being highly accountable because let me tell you having a multimillionaire angry that something didn't happen and your boss calling you and going what happened and you need to fix it like now uh it taught me something about being accountable and making <laughs> sure that again people's money is not going missing so right um i will tell you i lived in vegas for a year Really? And uh, those people that say that you can't run away from your problems never move to Vegas. <laughs> that's, that's just the just, <laughs> just, just, just truth. Yeah. Uh, tell me about hedge funds. Oh, so uh, I left the patent trademark company and joined a hedge fund. Uh, half of the building was in Greenwich and half the building was in New York. I think that was on okay. purpose, so I guess maybe it was all tax breaks or something. Very smart people, let me yeah. tell you. Yeah, yeah. Investors, come on the Greenwich side. And then, you, you know, the engineers come through the New York side. So, <laughs> so it was very strange. But, um, but at the time, I worked on uh, domestic, uh, uh, so there's something called DTCC. It's, it's Domestic Trading Corporation. Uh, it was domestic bonds. And, the, you know, we, we would also, I also do things like Bloomberg pricing. and It doesn't matter. I mean, but the hedge fund was during the 2006 to 2008 run-up. So if anyone understands what happened, um, it was really a casino at the time, right? And people may not, and some of my financial friends may argue with me, Rob, it's not a casino, but you're placing bets, thinking certain companies or certain stocks or certain puts or certain, you know, there's a lot of different things there. Um, but essentially, you're placing bets on a winner. And other people are placing bets on a loser. It's still gambling. Instead mm -hmm. of horses, it's just companies, right? So... I was one of the, uh, 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 what do you call a software principal, one of the leader, leading developers. But at the time, uh, I remember feeling so helpless when traders way far, way far away from where we were affected people's jobs. I remember a certain trader made a bad bet in energy, and the ripple effect ended up with 200 people losing their jobs in Connecticut. Mm. And this guy out somewhere else had no clue what he did. Now... Um, it, it, I was just flabbergasted. And then uh, one of the reasons, and it was a good job for a while, but in the 2008 crash, if, uh, if anyone remembers, this is the time where um, it, you know, McCain was like, the, fun, the, the, the fundamentals of the economy are strong, and Obama was running against McCain. Mm -hmm. That was around the time Bear Stearns collapsed, and it caused a massive cascading effect, and it put us in, the, uh, in a recession. So I was there uh, when a lot of companies were failing. It was a very high-pressure situation. Once again, I was in that moment in my life where I need to do something else. So foolish me, I go, I'm going to leave finance. I'm going to go into like inventory control and physical security. That's what led to the whole Burby thing years later. Okay. So yeah, I left finance to do that. So, so I always keep coming back to finance for some reason. But, but, uh, but yeah, the hedge fund was definitely a, a critical experience for me uh, in, in terms of understanding the mechanics of our financial and economic systems. So you currently work at Webster Bank as Senior Vice President, Head of Digital Delivery. Yes. Uh, translate that for me. <laughs> so when you grab your mobile app or you go on to online banking, that's, that's us. 
So, uh, so yeah, if you want to open an account, a new checking or savings or CD, that's us. We, we are the face, and we talk to all the other systems below that and behind that. So, uh, so it, once again, if it's not working, we know within seconds, and we have to fix it. Right? So talking about high levels of accountability, and then on top of that, in terms of the values, transparency. So uh, if something doesn't work, we have to be transparent with our customers mm -hmm. and let them understand, listen, we are here in the process, we're gonna fix it, uh, but things are great. So right now we, we are, have a merger of equals going on and I have the great pleasure of working with some great colleagues to across the entire market from New Jersey all the way up to Maine uh, and experiencing uh, helping communities. And one of the things I recognize about my role here is I'm actually an ambassador of the bank. I realize I have a huge responsibility because folks look at me and they say, I'm leading these groups. And, um, and, and the, the great thing about Webster for me, that where I work, is they have a commitment to the communities around them. They have a great program right now with the, with the state, uh, with Governor Lamont and others, where uh, they are going to do first time mortgages uh, and support that and back that for folks who are struggling to get their, their first homes and making sure they get appropriate rates and how to help them. So um, it's, it's a really good time, and I'm, and I'm really appreciative of that work that I do uh, for the community around us. Awesome. So uh, just in full disclosure, I will tell you that I was standing in uh, Webster Bank this afternoon, and so before you leave tonight, I want to get your cell phone number so that if anything <laughs> screws up, that um, I, I know who to call. <laughs> So you've kind of answered this along the way, but I'll put a, a finer, finer tip on it. So with uh, this kind of education and employment history, uh, how does this background position you well to become governor? Well, as I was saying earlier, I've had a lot of work experiences. I think some folks work in one field, one thing for 20 years. Now, you may be really great at that one thing, but it doesn't give you sort of this wider view, right? This going deep and going wide. Uh, but for me, being across multiple areas of finance, multiple areas of food, multiple areas of, uh, you know, physical security, inventory, it gives me a different view of things. I think what really makes me unique is being a problem solver, a proven problem solver, um, who's been in the trenches, but also at the executive level at the same time. So I've had that whole gamut I've had to work hard for every step of the way and fight and scrap for myself, for my team, for our customers, and for our stakeholders to make sure that we deliver successful solutions. So fundamentally, I'm a solutions candidate. Unlike others who uh, may not have the same experiences, I think my background differentiates me better and makes me a better candidate than them. Awesome. So uh, for every one of these faith exchanges that we have, uh, we get to kind of this midpoint of where we're at, and I ask one question okay. that uh, I want to know the answer to of all of our community leaders, and that is this, that in this church, we do our best to serve the town of Enfield and the people that are in it as best we can because we feel that we were called by Christ to do that. Now, I do not believe that you have to have that faith background or any faith background at all in order to be a wonderful community servant. But the question is, like, that's why we do the work that we do. Why do you want to serve the people of Connecticut? The same way you're called to do more and affect your community and you're doing God's work, there's also the people's work. And I think that for me, something's telling me that I need to do more. It's no different than when I tried to help the kids at Sandy Hook or any kids after that or even now trying to help the wider community. I'm called to do something great, called to greatness. Um, and I think that's what all of us should uh, ask ourselves. You know, I've asked myself uh, constantly in my life, how, how can I do more? How can I be a better version of myself? And I think if you really stop and you listen, and some people say it's the word of God, it's, you know, 
And for me, I think that that's why I do what I do, because I think someone has to do more for the communities around them. Um, and it takes a certain type of individual, set of individuals, to some are shepherds and some are not, right? But we all form a community, and we all need each other. And that's the way I look at it. Well, we have another guest that is here with us who is uh, the candidate for lieutenant governor, uh, Dr. Chip Beckett. Come on down. You are our next contestant. <laughs> Welcome, Chip. We are so glad that you are here with us. Have a seat. So, uh, Chip, you are a doctor of veterinary medicine specializing in horses and dairy cows. That's how I started 40 years ago. Awesome. Don't hold it against me, but, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Connecticut River Valley was the agricultural breadbasket of the U.S. back in the 1800s. We fed the Civil War. We fed the Revolutionary War soldiers. Um, and a lot of that semblance was still here when I started in 1982. So I had my pickup truck, and I came up here to do horses on this very street, um, and we'd go all the way down to the shore, and basically between Route 8 and... Uh, I guess Willimantic, we covered the whole central part of the state, going to dairy farms, cattle farms, um, horses, sheep, goats. Awesome. So I'll ask you the, the same question that I asked to, to Rob. So uh, with your education to, uh, to become a doctor, with uh, your, uh, your history of, of work, doing that kind of work in town, um, how will that help you to become lieutenant governor? Well, I think the interesting thing about both Rob and I are we're operations people. We have to make things work. And, uh, you know, I had a friend of mine that was a horse trader um, with all the baggage that goes with it, but he said the problem with owning a farm or the vet business is you're in the trucking business, you're in the landscape business, you're in the construction business, you're in the pharmaceutical business. So there's been, my life has been in one company, my own, but it's been a tremendously varied life and I think a lot of small business people don't realize how much variation there is compared to a large corporation where you get a lot of specialization. You know, we have to be the master, not only jack of all trades, but the master of most of them. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. So um, educate me for, for a minute. I, I have a decent idea of what a governor does. What does a lieutenant governor do? Some people say they look good, but other than that, <laughs> I, I that's think, what my grandmother would always tell me. She was like, how are you going to pay for that with your good looks? And I would look at her and say, yes. <laughs> I don't know that I have that going for me, so I'm hoping that, um, that what I can do is provide um, a different perspective for Rob. Um, I was active with the Capital Region Council of Governments. I was chairman there. I was chairman of Glassbury Town Council. So I, I think we need to integrate state and local government much, much more than it is instead of saying their respective things and they each have their problems. I think there are some policy things and operations, lean management that we need to bring so we don't kineticize businesses and activities. <laughs> no, no, in the state Jeff, from now on, it's going to be called nutmeg. <laughs> nutmeg. There we go. We're, I'm trademarking this here tonight. I expect royalties later. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, Chip, here's, uh, here's where the kind of rubber meets the road. This is where we're going to start asking some, some more fun questions that are, that are interesting. And uh, time for y'all to educate us and kind of tell us about your record. Um, so I just looked online, top level easy kind of Google search kind of thing, right? Chip, you were a Republican for a long time. Yes, I was. What happened? Uh, I was on the train and they dropped the car off and kept going. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm with you now. I, I, was, I was on a physical, like, literal train there for a minute. Okay. No, no I, you know, and um, I tell people, I think our polarization is a result of politics, but I think the really far progressive left annoyed enough people in enough places that you've got this reactionary right. And I don't think either one is correct, but I think both parties have 
centrifugally spun around to their most extreme members and left 80% of us in the middle out. Mm. And I think if you think about Reagan ran on blue dog Democrats, and I think moderate Republicans and blue dog Democrats are two sides of the same coin. I mean, do you worry about social issues and your neighbors first and the fact that you gotta pay the bills? Or do you worry about you pay the bills first and you have to help your neighbors with what you've got? But I think it's really two sides of the same coin. Um, and it's not an either or question. I, mean, I think most of us fit into that both rather than either or. But our political choices have become either or to the extreme. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you're both independents. Um, and uh, I, I need some help with that one. Because uh, I can somewhat tell you what a Democrat is. I can somewhat tell you what a Republican is, within reason, right? What is an independent? Uh, Rob, I'm going to look back to you for Sure, the sure. I, so I was asked to run for governor of the independent party, and part of that is being a standard bearer and defining what it means to be an independent. And for us, what... Chip and I and what the campaign and the folks that work with us are trying to represent is civility, respect. We talked about earlier some other values. We value accountability, transparency, problem solving. We believe, as Chip indicated, that 80% of us agree on the same things. We shouldn't just become disagreeable with each other because we disagree on one or two topics on the edge. So compromise and collaboration are also what we represent. I think that is the independent mindset, and that's what we represent. I think one of the things that was uh, confusing for me, and I've been trying to, to pull this together, because you know we don't do uh, party affiliation in Georgia, right? Like you, you go and vote where you want to go vote on primary day and all of that kind of stuff, is that independent does not mean unaffiliated. They are two different things, right. So the unaffiliated mean you're not part of any party. And that's actually the largest voting bloc in the state. There's over 900 and... Yeah, 950,000. 50,000, right. And uh, so when you take the unaffiliated independent, most people think I'm independent of the two major parties. But I would argue the unaffiliated independent is really the same. It's just, are you part of a party or not, mm -hmm. right? So the unaffiliated are the largest voting bloc for a reason. Why is the largest majority of voters unaffiliated to any party? Because it means they're unhappy, and they're looking for something else, and they're sort of standoffish, waiting for that better thing, and we are that better thing. So I, I think the other thing that was confusing to me, um, just by virtue of knowing the history here in Enfield, so you know my folks here in this church and the folks that are watching at home, is uh, a few years ago there was a split in the Democrat Party that then spun off a third party that kind of morphed into the Independent Party of Enfield, yeah. which was actually more progressive than the Democrat Party of Enfield. This isn't that. <laughs> well. Right? Well, I think also, and, and, you know, I'd love to get Chip's opinion on this one, but um, we are looking for being open-minded. I think that's part of the problem in America, in Connecticut today, is that folks have gotten so, as Chip was alluding to, disagreeable that they're not even willing to engage. So regardless if you're really more progressive than the Democrats, you have some points of view that we should listen to. And everyone's welcome. What's not welcome is shutting others down and being exclusive, uh, pushing people out. Uh, so I believe that the independent party represents that moderate middle where we want to be inclusive, we want to have that diversity, you know, we want to have that equity, we want to make sure that both the suburbs, the urban uh, uh, cohorts, everyone is represented well. Uh, you know, Chip, I don't... The only thing I would say is every outlandish statement probably has a kernel of truth in it. And if you could talk about what those kernels of truth were, a lot of people would agree on most of them. Or you could make a compromise package. And I think that's what really needs to happen when people talk about, there's a different idea, what do we agree about? The other thing I think is important that I did when I was chairman of the town council is 
I could be happy with a half a loaf. I don't have to have everything I ever dreamed of today. Mm. I could settle that we, you and I agree on something and we'll do that and we can argue about the rest next year and see how our incremental changes improve things and if it solves the problem or if we have more work to do. Mm -hmm. um, Chip, I'll go right back to you and then come back over to Rob because I, I wanna hear both of you answer this one and I am certain I am certain that you have been asked this question multiple times before. What do you tell people when they say voting for a third party is a wasted vote? The best retort I got was last week. Abraham Lincoln was elected as a third party candidate with 39% of the vote. And I told him, thank God, because I think the other alternatives would have been far worse <laughs> for us today. Okay. <laughs> I, I would make the argument that Name me a single industry where less choice is better. Food, cars, meeting a loved one, family. Name anywhere in life where less is better. I think most people would agree that more choice is better. Also, from an economic perspective, now that's just from a cultural perspective, from an economic perspective, it's been proven that monopolies and duopolies are bad for customers and bad for economies, right? If all you have is one, look how we are with uh, energy right now. Are we happy having one or two major providers? Think about your telecommunications. How happy are you to only have one or two? They control costs, they raise them, and they create a problem for you. More choice offers more competition, which drives costs down, which improves the outcomes for everyone. And I think that's really what folks need in Connecticut. Okay. I'll buy that. I, I need more, um, more information on how third parties work then because, you know, there are parts of it that I don't get. So on your website, there is a, an article that says, Bob Stefanowski is trying to take your party line on the ballot. How does that work? What? So let me take a shot at this one. So the issue that the independent party has right now is that they have um, bylaws that do not properly protect members from getting elected or nominated um, without outside major parties coming in. Historically, there have been a lot of cross endorsements. And um, the way it looks like right now is that the party wants to go in another direction. Again, they asked us to run, asked me to run, in order to show that new standard. We want to be our own party. Um, and we right now have an ongoing issue where party, party sovereignty is not being respected, where uh, other major parties can come in and try to usurp it by being nominated from the floor, which you can't do in a primary, mm. right? So one of the key values of being a major party is that you get to have a primary, and it's held in every town all across the state. But in order to do so, you need 20% of the electorate vote, minimally. This is an electoral vote. Yes, yes. So one of the things we're looking at doing with the independent party, and, and I would say the independent third party movement generally, is uh, bring greater choice and give, up, give the voter the opportunity to have different options, different voices, different ideas, rather than trying to take away vote, you know, uh, uh, folks like us from even getting to the general election. So um, I'll end on this note and keep it very simple, which is, Third parties are treated differently than major parties, and we need everyone's collective help in order to uh, strengthen our democracy with more choice. Okay. So in this church specifically, but the United Church of Christ, that's our denomination for you know, uh, many churches across the state, uh, we say, fairly boldly in town that social justice is a matter of faith, that uh, that's where we stake our claim. 
So we take the biblical command literally to love our neighbor, to care for the least of these. So the United Church of Christ has been very forward in the pursuit of racial justice, queer rights, equal pay for women, uh, things of, of this nature. Where does the independent party stand on this? I'm a member of the South Congregation of Glastonbury Church. I believe in all that, and I think that's the appropriate thing for our party, and that's part of the compromise is, you know, we have gay and lesbian people that have always existed in the society, whether it was a closet or whether it was out in the open. Um, doesn't really matter whether, you know, people of color, this is a country founded on opportunity and an idea of freedom and opportunity for yourself to pursue as you best could. Um, it's not an ethnic tribe that grew up somewhere in the Alps or the Caucasus Mountains or something like that, uh, like so many nations in Europe. So I think to take that American idea that um, we came here out of choice and want to have a community but also pursue our personal self-interests, our own pursuit of happiness, I think means that we have to include everybody. And I'd just like to add one thing. I think that a lot of folks are kind of concerned about civil rights in this country, considering the direction the Supreme Court is going. Mm -hmm. And I would argue there's never been a more important time. Uh, and I know every politician will say, this is the most important election. But given the direction and the temperament and the overheatedness of our nation and our, and our state right now, I would argue that there's never been a more important time to have an independent party an independent governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, secretary of state. Why? Because we understand both sides. We're in the middle. We are a party of inclusiveness. We are a party of acceptance, tolerance. We need more of that. We need leaders who are willing to stand up and say we need more acceptance, not less. And that's what we represent. So, yes, I, I hear you. And I will say that I completely agree that, you know, as a... Uh, queer pastor in town who is married. Um, that is one thing that is, uh, is really at the, the top of my mind whenever I think about uh, who is going to get elected. Like, is my marriage going to stand? So I will read to you from your website that says, the independent party is open to all electors without discrimination on the grounds of race, color, creed, gender, or religious beliefs. It does not say sexual orientation or gender expression. And so, you know, I, I want to hear y'all go on record here tonight, right? We're making news, friends, um, of uh, like, I'm, if you get elected, that I'm going to be sure that my marriage is going to stand in the state of Connecticut. Right. Yeah, and I think that we need to fight for that because, again, it's, it's rights. It's the human condition. We shouldn't be stripping people uh, in, in going back to some uh, period of lack of tolerance or lack of acceptance, we should be moving forward, not backward. And I think that we need to strengthen those laws, not weaken those laws. So along that, uh, that same, same vein, uh, we have recently seen in uh, the great state of Kentucky that um, abortion is a powerful motivating factor for people to come out and vote. Mm -hmm. Um, in great numbers and in surprising ways to the people of Kentucky. Um, where does the Independent Party stand on reproductive justice? And are you prepared for the people of Connecticut to, to turn out and vote like that? Well, I know it's definitely a hot topic right now. And I'll just give an answer and then uh, Chip can uh, jump on in. But uh, we stand with women. It is a health care issue. Uh, the average uh, uh, Connecticut voter expects that in Connecticut. And it's the right thing to do, right? We, we want to protect our doctors and our nurses. I do not believe they should be prosecuted for um, conducting a, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a procedure uh, in order to protect a mother or even, uh, in some instances, to be... You know, there's certain situations, as we understand. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but again, I, where the independent party stands is one of inclusivity 
and standing with the average voter in terms of in being the moderate voter, what they would expect, which is this is a healthcare issue. We need to protect those loading us. I agree with all of that. I think as a doctor, the one challenge I've really had is when I was, my wife and I had our first pregnancy, it ended in a miscarriage. Mm. And I've read some of these bills where they are going to ban ectopic pregnancies and miscarriages from abortion for any reason whatsoever and prosecute the health care team. If you, and I understand the reluctance to, for some people to say life begins at conception and it, they're assuming it's a healthy child to be born in nine months, perfectly fine, with loving parents that can afford them and take care of them. That Disney World scenario doesn't exist for everybody. And I don't know why any husband or significant other would be interested in having their wife become septicemic because they can't have medical care and potentially die because somebody's theoretical idea about what should happen to children and other families that they have no financial or social interest in helping or taking care of. Thank you. Um, okay, let's let's pull back from hot topics for a minute. Um, Rob, tell me about ranked choice voting. Well, ranked choice voting to me is one of the best ways to guarantee a great, great democratic result. So what we want to do, and I'm a big proponent of it. Oops, sorry, the microphone. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big proponent of ranked choice voting where and I, I, I've actually been around the state and folks don't actually know what it is, mm -hmm. right? So I just want to explain a little bit which is you, you would take maybe three candidates or four candidates, you rank them in your order. And what happens is that if the lowest gets eliminated, if someone doesn't get 50, greater than 50% right off the bat, you have a runoff and the bottom one gets removed and their second choices get applied up to the remaining candidates. That is a refreshing take and approach to make sure that you're not throwing your vote away. You're not the spoiler vote because you know what? Uh, I may still like this person, uh, but I'm like, darn, I feel like they may not win, so I'll vote for this guy um, just because I think I'm gonna, I only have one shot at it. Yeah. Again, it's, it's better for choice. And for us, one of the things we would like to introduce uh, as soon as possible upon being elected would be to introduce ranked choice voting to the legislature. I would agree with all that. I think Connecticut needs voter registration overhaul generally. Um, we all heard about Georgia's changes, but Connecticut is a much harder place to vote than Georgia ever thought about. Um, if you want to see uh, ranked choice voting in action, tomorrow night, um, Alaska, the great state of Alaska, will be using ranked choice voting. Um, on which uh, uh, Sarah Palin will be on the ticket, and uh, my father would vote for her if, uh, if he could, not because he likes her politics, he just thinks she's pretty. <laughs> just, just saying. Dad, if you're watching, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chip, tell me about school choice. Well, we had a child that was special needs early, um, and I think as I look at schools, public schools have done a great job for America for 150 years. And I think most kids go to them, and I think most kids will continue to. But I think like Rob's talking about choice for voting, some people just don't fit in the plain vanilla mold of 80%. You know, there's successful Montessori schools, there's successful military academies, there's successful um, apprenticeship programs. And I think if your kid is not doing well, our obligation as a society is to educate them so they're productive citizens once they become adults. So why do you try to keep somebody locked in a system that is not working for them? I think we need to have school choice so that if parents say, my kids are not succeeding in rising to their highest ability to recognize their gifts and talents, they need to be able to go somewhere else where they can learn that ability. And I don't think it should be an affront to anybody. I have people that send me second opinions and ask me my opinion because they didn't like their veterinarian's opinion. And I've had people go to other people saying, can you send my records? And we all do it with medical care. And if you have a major procedure, 
the doctors tell you, who do you want to go see for a second opinion before we start surgery? Mm -hmm. So why should schools be offended, public schools be offended by the fact that they don't fit some kids and there could be a better solution for that kid? And it really comes to, in my time in public office, I think students in schools are number four on the priority list, maybe. Um, they should be number one. And our first judgment as adults should be, how do we maximize this kid's education for their own opportunity and gifts and talents to be recognized as adults for their life, not ours. Thank you. Okay, so in our waning moments that we have together, uh, everybody that sits in that chair always says, it, it's amazing how fast an hour flies by <laughs> whenever we're here. That you sit down and you're like, how are we going to talk for an hour? And then you realize like, wow, that went fast, <laughs> didn't it? <laughs> so uh, we have, what, double-digit days left between now and the, the November election. So uh, right now this is wonderful exposure for, uh, for those people that are both a captive audience in this room and those that are watching now or will be watching later. Um, so... One of my last questions is, uh, what is the last thing that you want to share with this audience that is watching you tonight so that they, they hear your kind of closing arguments between now and November? Well, why don't you go first and then I'll, <laughs> I'll go last. Well, what I would say is we're at a very polarized time in the United States um, for our country, and, um, and that's true in the state of Connecticut as well. And we went through a similar thing around the Civil War, and I think we need a different political situation than what we have now. Um, I don't think either party, either major party, really benefits nor represents the vast majority of the public. Mm -hmm. And I think the public demand should demand better. And I don't think the public should be willing to accept the choices they've been given um, for the reasons they've been given them. Uh, I'd like to add to what he's saying. So why vote for us? Well, first of all, why are we running? I'm running, we're running, to make Connecticut a much more affordable place to live, work, and retire. That's one. Two, we believe that um, small business, we have the best approach to bringing small business back as working, um, uh, working men, uh, family men. We also understand what it means to be you know, in a large corporate environment as well as in a small business environment, being entrepreneurs, understanding what it means for people to go through the struggle. We also are, have the ability in what I call a safe place, safe space, where the polarization that Chip's referring to, you need people like us to bring multiple people to the middle so we can talk about collaboration and compromise. They don't have to be dirty words anymore. It's okay to say, you know what, I disagree, but... Let's talk. Let's listen. Maybe I might learn something. Have an open mind. Civility, respect for your neighbor, respect for your opposition. What happened to that? Compromise doesn't mean everybody gets everything they want, as Chip mentioned, but it means that most people get what's best for them. And I believe we offer the best chance to do that. So lastly, I'd also state this. The majority, and there's polls out there, that the majority of Americans are looking for a third party. Why? Because they believe the two major parties are not doing an effective job to address their issues. And they're looking for qualified, viable candidates like Chip and myself in order to, um, and it's hard what we're doing. I'll be honest, right? It's very challenging what we're doing, right? Especially running against two multimillionaires who can, <laughs> hey, if you want to vote for someone who can spend more money, vote for them. But if you want to vote for somebody who has more ideas, vote for us. Right? And if you're happy with the way Connecticut is, do nothing. Change nothing. But if you're unhappy with the direction of Connecticut, I always challenge people to think act, act, uh, differently, act differently, be differently, and it starts with voting differently on November 8th. Awesome. So if there is somebody out there tonight who, uh, over the course of this past hour, just said, oh, God, I'm an independent, how did they get involved <laughs> in your campaign? Well, two things. One, uh, hodling2022.com, H-O-T-A-L-I-N-G, 2022.com. You bring it to both of us. Two, 
uh, we actually have a statewide campaign. So if you go to the voter registration, do it all online within two minutes, you can check what party you're in. And if you realize, oh my God, I'm an independent, then we would challenge you to get, uh, get yourself down to Guilford, August 23rd, Tuesday, August 23rd, next week, uh, at 7, 7.30, in order to vote and participate in the caucus. And hopefully you nominate us as independent party members to be in the independent party ticket and not a, a major third party candidate. Mm. We're looking for contributions. Oh, absolutely. Donate now. Go to hodling2022.com and donate now, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, we, we appreciate having you here with us tonight. Yeah, appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, for those of you that are, are watching at home, we have one more faith exchange uh, for this month. We will have more in the, the days to come, but for this month, next Monday night, August 22nd, we will have Representative Joe Courtney to be here with us. A couple of just very church-centric announcements that uh, this Friday we will have a, a concert out on the front lawn, and that will be Cobblestone Road. They are kind of classic rock, um, so I hope that you will come out. That is 7 p.m. on Friday, August the 19th. On uh, the following Friday, the 26th, we will have a movie night out on the front lawn, free pizza, popcorn, drinks, and we'll be showing The Greatest Showman at 8 p.m. And then finally, um, I want to share with you that every year on August 31st, uh, it is International Overdose Awareness Day. And so for the second year, we were going to be having a vigil, International Overdose Awareness Day vigil, where we will come together and remember those people that we have lost and pray for those that are still with us. August 31st, that is a Wednesday at 7 p.m. Friends, I uh, hope that you have been informed well here tonight. Uh, thanks to these two gentlemen for coming and uh, getting peppered with questions uh, again. And until I see you again, good night. <laughs>